Well, good morning. I'm Robert Kelly. I'm one of the pastors here at uh, the church. If we haven't yet met, I'm so glad that you guys have come on out for uh, season five, episode two of the series formerly known as The Walking Dead. There was obviously a little bit of confusion that took place last week with the whole zombie Easter. Apparently some of you have somehow gotten the impression that I'm recommending these horrible, horrible shows to you guys with emails, texts, tell me which one you like, what do you want, where should I start? I only, I, I only watch these for cultural research. I don't understand how this whole misconception, the gore and the brains and the whole thing, I mean, now I'm doing it for sermon prep, but, but you know, I could hardly, it would be professional malpractice for a pastor to be recommending uh, any of these uh, zombie flicks. So, um, and as we began, you know, I of course, I, I like them for all of the uh, meta messages that are woven into them, some of which we began to explore last week as we looked at how the genre itself taps into some existential angst about who we are and our purpose here and uh, all sorts of questions uh, about um, the kind of lives that we live. And with that, we asked what is becoming an increasingly common question. People asking, what if we are the walking dead? What if it is a great metaphor for modern day life? One author, uh, Dr. Matthias Klassen, in an article entitled, The Anatomy of the Zombie, a biopsychological look at the undead other. <laughs> That's really his title. Um, he said, that the zombie also seems to be an apt vehicle for more culturally contingent anxieties. This, the focus on how monsters and monstrous narratives reflect the anxieties of their times, has been commonplace in horror study for a long time. In this analysis, the zombie probably confirms the moral suspicion that most monsters are, or were, actually human. And so the question before us is, what if the human monster is us? What if we are the human monster? You can think of it like this. I'll sketch, I'll sketch it out because I'm, I'm secretly an amazing artist. <laughs> and so you could see the uh, little you here. I was practicing it because you know it's a complex drawing. And you inhabit some space, not merely physical space, but all of the realms that you dwell in. That is your space, your realm, your world. And so you can sort of, it's really hard to draw a nice circle for him. Um, you, you live in it, so th you can't think of this realm as simply a physical place. This, this area that you inhabit has all of these different forces that press in on you. And as they press in, they shape you. You become, in response to these forces, something, someone. If the forces are sufficiently vicious or violent, it has an impact on you. And where the kind of impact is a little bit difficult to determine. But you can rest assured that as these, the, the forces within your sphere press in on you, you can be certain that they will come out of you in some way. So what you press into it will certainly eventually come out. This is a very common concept in much of the scriptures. Actually, we experience it in much of life. Because what if the influences and the powers of this world are the things that are in large part causing us to hurt other people or to do bad or to fail to do good? All of these things press in and it, and it happens in such a way that we begin to even lose sight of the forces that are causing the outputs. Because we're so immersed in that realm we live in it's difficult for us to begin to see anything outside of it. The Bible is telling us 
That is precisely what we have to do. We have to be able to see these forces, resist these forces, change those forces, and the only way we do that is to wake up, is to wake up. And when that happens, the scriptures promise us that we can matter for all of eternity. So open up in a Bible, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 2. I was not able to cover everything I wanted to cover from this text last week, so we're going to look at it again in a slightly different way. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. This realm that we live in, we sort of stumble around in what we could call the night of the living dead. For fans of the 1968 George Romero film, you'll appreciate how subtly I slipped that title in. The scriptures tell us that we sort of stumble around in this realm. So what does it look like? Ephesians 2, verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Last week we looked a little bit about the idea of how the Bible talks about us as the walking dead. And in that, it actually references the way we live, the, the realm we live in. Not, not merely the steps we take, the road that we're on, but when it speaks about a walk, the Bible is talking about the, the, the place we choose to live. There's the path that leads to righteousness, there's the path that leads to sin, and all of that kind of stuff. And so you have to think of it in terms of a realm, even a journey that each person is on. And so this is called, this is a much better drawing, it's called the world here. That's what he tells us. You follow the ways of the world. And so that is the sphere, the realm, that we live in. The realm called the world. And it is marked by death. That is its defining characteristic. There was um, a time a while back where we had gotten some squirrels in the attic. And of course, we were trying to use the have a hearts to get them out of the attic, but we weren't as, we weren't as like, diligent as checking the have a hearts to see if we actually caught anything. So anyway, in the end, we ended up with dead squirrels in, in the attic here. And my office is right up there behind it, like near the attic, and of course, one day I'm like, man, what is that smell? Of course, you kind of track it, you follow it, and you realize that, you know, these dead, it's the tiny little, I mean, I, don't, I shouldn't tell you that, but they're tiny little squirrels, dead, and it's stinking up the whole place. Like, it's just one dead little animal. You can't imagine this thing would, sure it does. And in a way, death does that to all of life. It permeates, the stink of death permeates everything that we do. For instance, let's say, you're determined to go about living your normal life. So, you know, you, you wake in the morning and you run your, your routine. You go to work, you read the paper, you do whatever it is. Maybe you, you drop the kids off to school or, and, you know, through the motions, you go. Okay? Why? If in the end, we all die, what good has happened here? What good? Well, you know, maybe I did do some good. Maybe it does have some meaning. Really? Because it looks to me like you've just joined the horde. The horde who is waiting to die. Waiting for a shot to the head to finally end their monotony. Well, you say, no, 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 it's different. Because I'm, I'm actually in school. I'm a student. And I'm working really hard in my classes. And my professors love me. And I'm going to do something good for society. That's great. That's fantastic. You found something that matters. That's great. To what end? To what end are you going to help humanity? Because remember, humanity is all going to die. Every person you helped is eventually going to die. Yeah, but that's different because, you know, I'm raising my kids so that when I die, humanity won't die. There'll be a legacy. Okay, so let's play that out a, a few thousand years. 100,000 years, aren't we all going to, isn't the universe expanding? Aren't we going to die a nice cold death as all the planets and stars suddenly separate too far? Or if it doesn't go out cold, it's going to go out hot when the sun explodes. And so to what end 
are you saving humanity? Well, no, it's different. The planet maybe is in jeopardy, but the universe will exist and we'll colonize other planets. To what end? So humanity survives? See, we often don't want to think about these things because in there, the stench of death has infiltrated every aspect of our living. Everything that we do, it creates, if thought about for many, an intolerable situation. To what end? Does any of this matter? And this is just how the ruler of the kingdom of the air, you caught that, the spirit of this day, in that passage, he said, the ruler of the kingdom of the air, Satan, the devil. That's how he wants it to be. He wants the stink of death to be on everything we do, to infiltrate this realm. I know this isn't like, you know, a lot of people don't like to talk about the whole Satan devil thing. You know, it sounds like you're kind of raving mad and all this. It's easier for us to believe in like a powerful God who's good and kind and benevolent, but we actually don't want to think about the other side of it because for some reason that makes less sense <laughs> to us. But, you know, so we have this. See, zombies are, are, there's a lot of them, so there's always a problem. But there's one thing that's sort of really great about zombies is that they're dumb. They're really, I mean, the, in the proper zombie genre, they're dumb. They're just dumb. Like, you know, later on in The Walking Dead, they'll, walk, they'll go to a house, and they want to clear the house of zombies, of course, before they go in and try to, try to find anything they can live on. So how do they do it? They knock on the front door. Dunk, 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 dunk. They're like, let's let them come out. Because the zombies are so stupid, they're just going to follow the noise, and they're going to come out, you're going to open the door, they're going to come out in the yard, you're going to kill them there on the, in the front lawn, rather than getting trapped in the house with them. So that's what they do, because they're dumb. But every once in a while, somebody messes with the genre. Some of you will remember the movie I Am Legend, Will Smith. All right, so he thinks he's alone in, in the world, and he's the last man surviving the, the virus, and he has his own friends to survive the loneliness, his dog and his mannequins. Mannequins that he sets up around the city that he talks to throughout the day, but of course they never move because they're mannequins, and there's no one else but him and the dumb zombies until... Anybody out there? Anybody? Please. You are not alone. Listen, uh, if you're planning a party or something, just tell me now, okay? Because, you know, I don't like surprises. And I swear I'll act surprised, okay? <laughs> Some learn the tricks of the trade. Some learn how to hunt. Some learn how to make you the one being pursued. In fact, this was the very trap that he had been using, now being used against him. You can imagine as he wakens up from dangling there by his leg when he realizes that his enemy is no longer mindless. There's something different. See, when the scriptures talk about evil forces in this world, there is an incredible intelligence behind it and it changes everything. It changes everything. The ruler of the kingdom of the air, hardly a mindless zombie, a personality, a person bent on our destruction. 
See, that's who rules the realm of this world. And it explains why there is so much anguish, so much hurt, so much suffering, and so much evil works. Because that is also one of these great inputs. The scripture we just read calls it your transgressions and sins. These are our evil works. So think about history for just a few moments. Where does racism come from? Why do we wage these these mindless wars, one country against another? What drives these things? You know, we talk about Wall Street, and most of us already know how wrapped up in greed that whole system is. Why? We take it as a, as a maxim that sex sells. Why does sex sell? Why, why, is, why is it that way? Why can we be so sure of it like, for instance, I know that many of you ladies have a hard time listening to anything I'm saying because you have been watching the hunky Jesus up on this screen. <laughs> like, for just a few moments, you need to try to, but, you know, how can we know these things? Why do we, why are we certain, you know, think about our, the, the incredible societal costs of alcoholism or drug use or gambling. Why? Why is that the air we breathe? Why is that the normal way the world works? Why is it we can depend upon those things to be the way the world works? Isn't that interesting? Why wouldn't it be flipped? Why wouldn't it be different? This is simply the way it is. Think about the fascination we have with the stars or the wealthy. You know, we know more about the relationship status of Jennifer Lawrence than you know, we do about how our neighbors across the street are doing. We might not even know our neighbors' names. You know, every single night we invite Megan Boone and Norman Reedus and all of their accomplices into our homes. And we don't have time for the elderly lady across the street who is once again eating alone. Why is this the normal way the world works? Consumerism has such a, gra a grasp on us. It's easy for us to even parody it. In uh, Dawn of the Dead, the sequel to Night of the Living Dead, George Romero, again, he uh, actually, the, the whole scene took place in a mall. This is what George Romero said about why he chose that. I socially, I socially knew, knew the, the, people the people that were developing this, the shopping mall where we shot Dawn. And it was the first, first shopping mall that we'd ever seen, the first indoor shopping mall that anyone had ever seen in western Pennsylvania. And I went out a few days before it opened, and I saw all these trucks coming in with everything that, you know, Americans could ever want. And uh, I said, wow, this is like a temple to consumerism. And, and uh, that was the thought, and that's where the thought came from. And then I... I started, to, I started to write a script that had that at its core. And I always sort of look for that in, 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 my, in my fantasy fiction. I'm, I'm always looking for uh, the core first and then sort of build around it. He built around a core by having first the zombies mindlessly walking through the mall by animal instinct. Then he had humans clear it, and once they had access to everything, they lived the high life as the survivors in this all-sufficient mall until they began to realize that it was vanity. And then it was ripped from them by another selfish group of consumers who beat them out of the mall and ruined the whole thing and returned it back to the zombies. Helps explain why it is so many Americans live in the, the midst of extreme and strangling debt so that we can get another trinket. We're wrapped up in this world. It's difficult for us to see past it. It's the cravings and the desires that this passage keeps talking about. Now, in all of this, this what's called the world, it's ruled by Satan, it ends in death, it's the, and you know, it creates the evil, evil inputs into us and of course leads to evil outputs from us. We reproduce very much the thing that was, was put in. That is the general experience we have according to the scriptures. But we were designed 
to thrive in the day of the living. Hear all those motorcycles? It was Dawn of the Dead. It was a gang of motorcycles that took over the mall. <laughs> wow. That's a moment right there. Let's just... But we were actually designed to thrive in the day of the living. So what does that look like? Look back at verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. The heavenly realms. This isn't heaven per se. It's the realm where heavenly principles rule the day. So it's all the kingdom of God kind of language that we've spoken about um, in the past. The heavenly realms where God's way is is the rule of the day, you might think of it. Then he says it ends in life. So you can see immediately the contrast from the world to heaven, from death to life. And of course, it also has its ruler. The scripture here said it was ruled by Christ, not this puppeteer of death, Satan, not the one who overpromises and under delivers, but in fact is led by someone with real power to give, not merely power to steal and kill and destroy. And verse 8, this is a key transition for us, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it's a gift from God, not by work so that no one can boast. That's the verse we looked at last week. Verse 10, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So now you have God's good works pouring into us. You're his handiwork. He has forever settled your value. Think about that. You're his handy. You're his artistic creation. The overflow of the creative cr God is you. You're his handiwork. And he created you just the way you are in just the time you live and in the place you reside in this realm to do good works. Isn't that what he said? To do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. You want to talk about the good works being poured into you, the value of your salvation as seen in the cross, God affirming who you are, his created handiwork pouring into you and giving you the promise of great works that matter, that matter for eternity just for you to accomplish. And of course, what does that do? It leads to an output. It leads to us now doing those very good works more and more and more. We um, naturally, we, we resist this whole idea of death. Of course we do. Who wants to die? We try to delay it as much as we can. Try to, try to, you know, try to put it off if even for just a few more days, a few more months, a few more years. There were uh, three men. They were traveling off to a distant conference. And it was a, a young hipster and a piano player and a kid from Jersey. But they got lost on the way to this conference. And they ended up in a foreign country. And in that foreign country, they were accused of working for the CIA and promptly sentenced to death. And so the young hipster, he's told, as the others are, that they get to pick one last meal before they're killed. So the young hipster, he says, I'll take a 90-minute a IPA, hoppy, and a, a gourmet grilled cheese with gruyere. So he gets his last meal, he eats it, and he's promptly executed. Then the piano player, he comes up, it's his turn, he says, what would you like for your last meal? He says, I'd like a big plate of boneless meat and a cupcake. And so he's given his boneless meat and a cupcake, that's his last meal, and he enjoys that last meal, and he's promptly executed. They come up to the kid from Jersey, and they say, so what would you like is your last meal? And he says, you know, I'd like a, just a, a fresh pomegranate. And they say, pomegranates, but they're not even in season. And he says, oh, it's... It's okay, I'll wait. <laughs> but delay as you might. Delay as you might. 
Death is coming for you. There's a psychological theory, terror management theory, and in it it says that all of us live in, in this knowledge that death is coming for us. And that when it happens, when we are forced to confront death, we act and react in a whole variety of very predictable ways. Self-esteem issues, we identify with a greater whole, we become nationalistic. It's, all, it's a very well-documented idea and theory that's been developed since the 80s, really. And uh, they loved 9-11, and they did a lot of research around that as to see how we responded and the kind of things that we did. But of course, most of these studies end by saying, you know, this is just the reality of death, and we have to find these coping mechanisms. But what if, what if we are supposed to look at our mortality? What if it is meant to jostle us a little bit, to wake us up? If it is supposed to be a shot to the head, if in fact that it's time to consider life in light of death. They call it the mortality salience hypothesis, hypothesis which is a fascinating idea. Because if you were to reflect on your own mortality now, it would actually change what you do, how you think, how you feel. Some say that we're actually attracted to the zombie genre for this very reason. Because it looks to something maybe after death. It makes us look square at death. I think this passage is trying to do a similar thing. Because we've got to make a decision. You see the top arrow. The only way to leave that realm is for you to make a decision while you still can. What realm do you want to live in? In light of death, why would you not choose life? Why would you not move to the heavenly realm? Why would you not, instead of submitting to the, the prince of this world, submit instead to Christ and bring all of the security and confidence that comes with it? Instead of allowing the evil works of this world, stand and resist them. Fight against them and allow God's good works to be poured into you so that your own life can, can reflect out the good works that you were made for. Why instead do we dwell in the stench of death when we have been given the promise of new life. And now here's the thing, what's so beautiful about this is then when that takes place, when you've made that jump, when you've made that decision, when you said, yes, I will in fact submit and trust in what the scriptures say about who I am and what I was meant for, when you make that switch, now it completes the circle. And now, instead of being marked in the, the realm of wrath, you're marked by mercy and salvation. And if you notice, the arrow comes back now, why? Because you were created to do good works. That's what you're here for. You know, in the zombie shows, there's always a point where somebody wants to just give up. They're like, really? I'm running again? It's why? I'm sick of this. I'm sick of the running. I'm sick of it. This is all so meaningless. It's just about survival. This answers the question as to why. Why we keep going. Why we keep trying. Why we keep doing good. Because it does, in fact, matter. And it will matter for eternity. You see, we're not supposed to be children of the night, but we're supposed to live for the good of the night. We take all of those things that has been happening, all of those inputs that have been coming and pouring into us, and we bring them right back into this world. And now we do it with a kind of strength that comes from outside of the realm. We're not, we're not the ones, we're supposed to be resisting those forces, but yielding to God's forces. And when that takes place, now we bring his light, his goodness, his life, his leadership, his security, his confidence into this realm to do the good works that you were created to do in advance by God as his handiwork. Let's do that together. Let's transition this world from darkness to light. Everywhere we go, every realm we live in, let's do that together. Would you guys pray with me? Lord, we're asking that you would help us to make this transition. So many of us, we just continue to dwell in this, this land of death and we yield ourselves so readily to its evil influences. And because of it, Lord, we, we put out all of this garbage. We don't want to be those people anymore, Lord. Stir up our hearts. May we yield to the love and the leadership of Jesus. May we instead start to see all of the good works pouring into us so that we might do all that you have for us to do we might live in the fullness, of, the fullness of all of your promises in the light of day and bring great hope to many. 
who still dwell in the darkness. We pray it all in Christ's name. Amen.